goodness sakes, that recording in progress is my cue to begin. Hi, everybody. This is Rick Alling, and I am the manager of community outreach for the School of Earth and Space Exploration on the ASU campus in Tempe, Arizona. And so that's a mouthful. And welcome to Virtual Night Sky for our version of Virtual Night Sky for December the 14th. It's almost the end of the year. And this will be the last one of the year. And I got some special things to talk to you about at the end of the program about the future and what we're going to be doing later. But uh, but for now, we've got a really great program for you. And, and it's very special because we're actually, I guess you if you picked up from the music, uh, four of your presenters today, myself included, we're in Chicago, Illinois right now. Why would any to go to Chicago in December, well, there's a very special function here. It's a major conference, and ASU participates every year in this thing called AGU, which is uh, American Geophysical Union. And more about that in a moment. I want to kind of just introduce the people that are on board. If you've watched our show in the past and you've been familiar with it, you'll recognize some of these, these faces and, and people. And so uh, uh, tonight, uh, helping me tonight is Kim Baptista. She is your webmaster. She's the one that gets all that kind of stuff organized in the background. She's the one that communicates with you. And she's also uh, our press relations for, uh, for the School of Earth and Space Exploration. So she has a big role to play in Chicago at AGU. And you'll hear about that in a minute. <laughs> Also, we brought Alex along. So Alex Branch is a, Alex Alex Blanch. I'm sorry, is a student in our program, and um, he's part of the outreach team. And uh, he traveled with us because we've got. Uh, I'll show you in a minute here. We've got this big, huge booth, and uh, we've set up a lot of stuff. The outreach here is really sort of one of the pinnacles of our year. Uh, you're going to meet somebody else that's with us. Uh, she is an employee of uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Orbiting Camera Team, and uh, so uh, Tori. <coughs> Rosenboro will be with us and she's going to kind of like talk about her role here and what she does with El Rock and some special things going on. I don't know if you know this, but this was this week, the seven, or the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 17 moon landing. And so we'll talk about that and get you up to date on that. Armand Dalla is with us, another student from our program. He's kind of taking care of things back at home. Armand, I really appreciate you being with us tonight. And Meg Hufford, my colleague of years, she's also uh, uh, back in Phoenix. And doing that, I have to tell you, I you know we've, we're kind of celebrating here because you don't go to Chicago in December if you can help it because it's really really cold and windy. It turns out it's a little bit warmer here than it is in Phoenix, so we win. So uh, so we're doing that. The tonight's program is kind of special because it's about this, and so I'm going to give you a little overview of what this is like to be in Chicago and do what we're doing here. Uh, we also just released uh, some uh, James Webb uh, new image, and a new paper came out, and that was just this morning. Uh, so if you haven't seen it yet, I think the big news media have picked it up. But we're going to talk to you about the latest, greatest web image and uh, and the the things behind that, and Alex will take care of that. As I mentioned before, uh, Tori is going to talk to us about uh, Apollo missions and LROC's role in documenting uh, parts of that, but also uh, a new project coming up uh, called Shadow Cam. And I think we've mentioned it on the program in the past, but Shadow Cam is just on the verge of starting to deliver some science, and she'll give us a little update on that. Um, <clears throat> I also want to talk to you about a very special project that I'm working on with a couple of, um, of uh, colleagues on campus, and we'll do that. I'm just about to sort of kind of go. Oh, let me do a little couple of housekeeping things. I sort of do this every time. Uh, first of all, um, if you are a K-12 educator, welcome. Thank you. A lot of times teachers uh, like to sort of uh, share this particular program with their students. And we love having you on board. And make sure you identify yourself if, if you are. Sort of make sure you, uh, you let us know that you're here. The other thing is we do this in webinar format. So we don't have a chat. You can't talk to us that way. But we do want you to use the question and answer button. Press that button, uh, share a question, share a thought, uh, anything you sort of think about along the way. We will be sort of looking at those things in the background, and we will find times during the program to kind of pull some of your questions forward to the uh, to the program, so we can sort of make sure we cover what you uh, what you want to hear about, what you want to want to learn more about. So do that. Uh, closed captioning is something that we do, and you're in charge of that on your own screen, so you can turn it off if you want or whatever. We do that in the background, uh, but uh, our suggestion is always to sort of keep the the main screen uh, uh, highlighted with some um, some of the secondary screen of the. 
people's faces on the side and uh, you can use closed captioning or not at your discretion. So those are the housekeeping things. Um, uh, so uh, I wanna talk a little bit about sort of AGU again. So Meg, I think uh, this is probably a good time. Let's just play some video. I just I just went out and captured some, some scenes from what we're doing here and I'll talk over it and we'll sort of like show you what's going on. What is AGU all about? Why is it important? <clears throat> Here you go. So, so basically, this is a gigantic conference. It's uh, uh, it's about geology. So, geophysical means it's about the geological science, but also the planetary sciences happen here. So, we are at the McCormick Place, which is a giant convention center. I, the, the room that we're sort of like set up in over here is big enough to hold my whole neighborhood. And here's just gives you a little sense about sort of you know what's going on, the flow of people. This is actually the poster sessions. So, this is low loaded with students. I think there are this year 18,000 delegates are on site, right? So that's kind of kind of amazing. And students and researchers actually sort of like use this opportunity to present posters. This room where the posters are is the size of a football field and they change them over twice a day. So you see seven football fields full of posters. Now we're in the main sort of like uh, convention floor. Uh, this is kind of fun. So you see there's lots of trade workers. There's people that sort of have instruments uh, technical instruments. These people make jewelry out of, uh, out of minerals and things like that. Uh, Esri there, those are the GIS people. So of course that would be part of it. Oh, look, here's around the corner. Now we're on Main Street here and NASA is like really, really prominent. They have this gigantic space. They must have 30 workers inside the NASA booth kind of doing things, big video wall. But look at this, there we are. Hey, check that out. ASU School of Earth and Space Exploration. So there were a big player here. So right between us and NASA is Johns Hopkins University. You see NOAA in the background. Uh, we do, we do, we just gotta, you know, do this big. We have this big three screen display. You see, oh, there's Alex in that seat over on the side. Now my screen froze a little bit. Um, but uh, but uh, you, we sort of use this as an opportunity to share our work with other people. We have lots of colleagues that come visit us in the booth and uh, and give us some, you know, sort of like just touch base every year. Uh, I said, I think there's 18,000 people here. Can you imagine being in a room with 18,000 geologists? That's a, that's pretty scary, actually, to think about. Uh, but it's, a, it's important for us. And then why geology? Remember that we are the School of Earth and Space Exploration. So the geological sciences, the geosciences, uh, the, and the geophysics is part of our milieu. And so we do that along with planetary sciences and, and uh, deep space astrophysics and all of that stuff. And so we are big players here. Just like NASA is here, we're partnering with NASA on a special project that is about education about bringing young people along into the business and all of that stuff, a very special project called SCOPE. And we are the leaders of that. That's a NASA funded thing. Those people are here as well. So th this is kind of a big deal for us. And we've been working hard uh, every every day. Uh, we set up this big booth. We've sort of been there uh, during the thing, during the program. Um, tomorrow, we're there for about half a day. And then we take take that all apart again, pack it into boxes, we'll get it shipped back to Phoenix. Alex and uh, and uh, Kim, do you have any comments about sort of what this is like? Is it fun? Alex, this is the first time you've been at AGU. What's it like? It's a blast. There are a lot of people here. Um, it's fun to be representing uh, ASU. I'm not a geologist, so the science, although very interesting, is not something I always understand. <laughs> <laughs> All this chemistry and rock terminology sometimes gets me a little bit confused. I have to ask a lot of questions, but um, it's just so fun getting to see everyone kind of working here. We get to talk to like different schools that we know. I, you know, I get to see people that I don't always get a chance to talk to, like the NASA booth, all the people there, even though it is the American Geophysical Union. They did have some James Webb stuff there, which uh, I, I'm really excited about, but it's, it's a lot of fun. And you're going to tell us a little bit about James. And then Alex and I, oh, so you I betcha. Up, you guys, can see this image in the background behind me is the skyline of Chicago. I took this this evening. So um, after sort of our afternoon on the trade show, Alex and I went over to the Adler Planetarium and we sort of met with some planetarium <laughs> people and saw some cool stuff. Alex in his background is sort of a little bit more about sort of like, you know, what our, our station looks like. And uh, Kim, what is, this is your first AGU too. Right? Is it a big deal. <laughs> this is my first AGU and um, yeah, it's, a little overwhelming at time because there's, there's feels like there's a million people, not eighteen thousand. But 
But uh, yeah, for me, it's been a great experience um, being here, now I'm not only being able to promote what our school is doing, but also meeting with my colleagues at NASA for the different missions that we're part of. So, you know, I collaborate with a lot of different folks and it's nice to actually get to meet them in person rather than just doing Zoom or phone calls or just emails. Um, so, right. and then I introduced you to one of them so that we're planning, you know, what right. we're doing in two years from now. Right, so so, so yeah. uh, Kim uh, sort of found the press people and the uh, the public or the uh, outreach people for the Europa Clipper mission. We're going to actually collaborate on some uh, some imagery and some three D technology and sort of share share resources about how we deal with the uh, uh, the outreach for these kind of programs. That's really great. So uh, where where else can we do that? So can I break in and ask him cool. to do one more little share? Oh, do you do have a more, share? Let me do one more little share. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here we go. We're at the booth. Oh yeah, so here's, there was Scott there in the background. They're actually displaying a JMARS thing. And here is the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Adversary, it's kind of like there. And so there's, and this this young lady here, you're gonna meet her in a little bit, is Tori. And uh, she'll be talking to us. She's the one from El Rock that's kind of showing people around. It's it's really just a wonderful to see people from around the world just come and they visit us and they see what we're working on. And and just generally, I have to say it, and I'm, I'm a prejudice a little bit, but um, people think that we're a big deal and we are a big deal. And so they appreciate what we're doing and all the different facets of uh, planetary studies and geophysics that we work on. I think it's been been great. So anyway, I, I'm going to kind of just move us along a little bit. And that's the, the, that's the reason why we are there. So, so we're, uh, you know, part of this thing. And uh, this is uh, Wednesday. And this is our night for virtual night sky. So we saw this comment a long time ago. And thought we'll just broadcast from here. Why not? Why not just do this from Chicago? Um, Two weeks ago, let me sort of shift over two weeks ago, just to remind everybody, I made a pretty big deal about sort of some of this new astronomical phenomena that's about to happen in your night sky. If you remember, we talked about the Venus starting up here on the Western horizon. It's just sort of one of those things that comes from around behind the sun. It just sort of pokes over above the Western horizon just before sunset. It's bright and it's big, it's easy to see, and it will be in our sky as we talked about for about nine and a half months. And so I wanted people to sort of like see if they could go out and find it and do that. And in a moment, I'm going to launch some poll questions. We'll do that in a minute. And so I want you to get ready. And so I'm going to ask you uh, if you actually did take advantage of that. And then the other thing we talked about, remember, is the arrival of Orion, the great sort of hunter, the Orion, the uh, it will appear sort of in the eastern part of the sky, uh, opposite Venus, but over in the eastern part of the sky, and start arriving in our night sky this time of year. And so the other part of our poll question coming in a moment is I'm going to ask you if you took advantage of that. So this is, we take these things seriously, and we consider these to be assignments that our audience is going to go out and try to do this and try to accomplish these goals. So, uh, so two weeks ago, I asked you to, and we'll see if you did. Uh, I have to acknowledge, though, that in that ensuing two weeks, it's been kind of cloudy, right? We've had just more storms and more days of cloudiness than I've seen in a long time. So I just want to kind of just, let's just test this. I'll give you a pass if you couldn't do it because of the clouds and the weather and all that stuff. But let's just see how many of us actually did this, got out there, found them, did that. This is great. I feel really, really good about this. I just wasn't sure whether anybody could actually uh, go out and witness these things. This is super cool. Look at that. It's about 50-50 if you've been able to sort of like target Venus. That's super, that's great. Will these clouds ever end? I mean, such that I've just, we need the rain. So I guess we have to sort of acknowledge that uh, that it's good that we're having the rain and the moisture is coming in and that all this stuff is happening. But, uh, but it does kind of block your night sky. So good. People are finding Orion. That's wonderful. We're about half and half on Venus. So don't give up. Keep looking. Um, we're not going to spend too much time in our night sky, but I wanted to acknowledge that these things are arriving. Then there's another... Uh, uh, kind of piece to this is sort of what I was saying, once Venus is up in the sky, you know, just start getting used to seeing it and track it as it follows the sun. We're going to go to, uh, you know, it'll be solstice time. <clears throat> 
uh, in, a, in about a week, uh, the winter solstice will be here, and uh, the object will be as far south as it'll go, and then as it goes and grows away from the sun, it'll start moving north in a little bit, and so, so watch it over the course of the next several months, and we'll see how that works. All right, guys, thank you for doing that. It just really does make me feel good, because I really thought, okay, we did this, we talked about this, got everybody excited, and then uh, we had uh, two weeks of bad weather, so, so good for you. Thank you very, very much for your work. Um, uh, so uh, the next thing we wanted to talk about, I mentioned it in the in the uh, introduction here, is a new image, brand new image from the James Webb Space Telescope. What we're learning is that uh, uh, the James Webb Telescope is delivering so much more information that we can uh, kind of even keep track of. Uh, but our role is to report on what's happening and what's associated with our school, ASU School of Earth and Space Exploration. So Dr. Roger Winters, you've heard that name before, uh, has released a paper. It just got released this morning at 10 a.m. And along with that paper is an amazing image that came with it. And I'm going to have uh, Alex kind of explain to us what's going on, why that's important. Thanks, Alex. Oh, your uh, volume's down. Sorry, I'm sorry, you, you're muted. There we go. Okay. I know we're out of our element a little bit. There you go. Thanks. I know. So, yes. So, just this morning, just this morning at around 10 o'clock our time, 9 o'clock Arizona time, we had a data release from ASU's PEARLS team. Uh, PEARLS stands for Prime Extragalactic Area for Reionization and Lensing Science. It's a mouthful, but basically we are mapping a large area of the night sky because there's a lot of things that can really con contribute to our scientific understanding of the universe and galaxies and evolution. Um, so the image you're seeing right now is part of that field. So this is, uh, it has a lot of objects in it. It is a large, medium deep wide field image uh, captured by the Webb Space Telescope. That basically just means it's a large area of the sky. We took a kind of medium measurement of all the light in it. So we weren't looking really, really, really deep, uh, taking long exposures, and we weren't just taking a quick snapshot either. So we got a lot of galaxies. We have some stars in our own Milky Way in here, but we're looking over uh, at galaxy evolution. We're looking at the different uh, structures and formations that happen over time as galaxies evolve because we have a pretty good sample of the different stages over time. We're also looking for gravitational lensing with large galaxies and galaxy clusters. There's enough mass in one area that the gravity is strong enough to begin to bend and magnify light, just like a magnifying glass here on Earth. And we can begin to detect things that get caught in those magnification kind of gravitational bands in these rings and we can start to see them. So we've detected stars this way. We, in fact, the furthest stars we've ever seen have been detected using gravitational lensing. And so this is a really powerful tool for observing the earliest and the dimmest things in our universe. And so to have a good area and study of this entire area of the night sky where we can find these things is a really good thing for looking even further than we would be able to normally. So this is a project uh, and a publishing by Dr. Roger Windhorst, uh, Dr. Rolf Danton, and many other teams here at ASU as part of the Cosmology Research Group and uh, as part of the smaller PEARLS team. So very, very exciting. There is also a video I want to share as well um, because they have a great video uh, that really ex explains it better than I can. So I'll share that now. So this is the North Ecliptic Pole time domain field. You can observe it with Webb all the time. And it's just absolutely stunning to see all these distant galaxies all the way back to the first few hundred million years after the Big Bang. I'm Roger Windhorst, a Regents and Foundation Professor at the Arizona State University School of Earth and Space Exploration. The first thing we see in these new images is that a lot of galaxies that were next to invisible or truly invisible to Hubble are quite bright in the images taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. My name is Rolf Jensen. I'm a research scientist in the School of Earth and Space Exploration. These galaxies are so far away that the light emitted by stars has been stretched. So it's no longer in the optical where Hubble excels. It's stretched to the point that you need to have an, a near-infrared or mid-infrared camera to pick up that light. What we see is not just the atypical galaxies, the very brightest, the most massive galaxies. We see now the normal galaxies, the typical galaxies. Uh, maybe the galaxies that wind up into galaxies like our own Milky Way today or even smaller than that. 
The sheer amount of data that we are getting is, is overwhelming. This is not something that you can do on your own. We have a whole team of students, researchers, we have collaborators all over the world. And you see faint galaxies everywhere and some beautiful bright galaxies. There are all these tidal tails of stars and gas that's being pulled out because these galaxies pull on each other like taffy and they pull out some material that looks like spaghetti and that's quite fascinating. Something I think the general public tends to misunderstand that researchers like us at ASU do is that we spend a lot of time on the computer running codes and algorithms to get these images to give us what we want. Because I am new to this field, so I'm a third year astrophysics graduate student, I feel very lucky to be coming into this field at this time because the Webb telescope is giving us data right now. And we're gonna be, again, seeing this universe in a way we have never seen it before. There's gonna be so much to study, I think and it can help me drive my career, keep me curious, and hopefully help make new discoveries myself. So great video talking about the image and really just an exciting thing that's coming out of ASU. Uh, Web something that we always kind of think of as being just NASA, but there are teams all over the world that are contributing images. We've had two big releases of images so far. We talked about the other one a few, uh, about a month and a half ago. So really exciting, but yeah, some great new scientific uh, information from James Webb and the teams here at ASU. Alex, thank you very much. That's really super cool. I, I, I really can always count on Alex to keep track of this because this is in his, uh, it's in his wheelhouse and his interest area. So, and then you can see on those you can't really see, but behind Alex here on those big monitors that we have, sort of that attract a lot of attention, uh, we were able to get this image up this morning uh, because we can't release them before they're released. So we got it up there, and uh, I noticed that we had it on, on our screen before NASA had it on their screen, and that made me feel really, really good. So, I just think we had someone on our team who was just. We had a few people on our team that were just really quick and developing slides that morning. <laughs> they got out of the hotel room and they downloaded them. And then they started, uh, they, they loaded them up on the slide deck and they're behind the curtain plugging in the USB drive. I wonder who that would have been. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. So I wonder much. who was sending you all of those. I, I mentioned the <laughs> other, I mentioned the other team members. I, I was getting sent a lot of images too. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think it's great. And Kim is the pipeline because she's the really the the communications connection with the researchers and all that stuff. So she makes sure we don't show the images before we're allowed to. Oh yeah, we oh my god. And gets us the images early too, so we don't have to wait as soon as they're released. We are well trained. I wouldn't even try that. That would be awful. I can tell. You. <laughs> All right. Hey, thank you. The, the gift that keeps on giving. I think that's really great. So uh, 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 when I started the program, I, um, uh, I said very seriously, right, uh, the way to communicate with us is through question and answer. So, so if you have any questions or anything, uh, I do want you to kind of like just drop it into that question and answer thing. We don't have anything right now, so I'm going to move on. And so um, one of my great pleasures about recently, about sort of coming here and all that stuff, is we, uh, we uh, wanted to make sure that we had a representative from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiting Camera team uh, that could be here in Chicago with us because it's, uh, I, I can't tell you how much I'm hearing about the data that they produce and how much people appreciate the work that they're doing. And we were fortunate to have uh, Tori come join us. And so I'm going to ask her to come to the screen and let us know what's going on. So Tori, welcome. This is the first time you've been on this Hi. show, right? It is, yeah. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah. So real quick, just tell us kind of how long you've been with uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance team. And then I'm let, she, uh, Tori has a, a, a presentation to give us about Apollo 17 especially. And, and so tell us a little bit about how long you've been on the team and, and then uh, we'll let you go. So. Yeah, so I joined LROC in March of 2021. I came on to make DTMs, which are digital terrain models on the moon, which is something I had done on Mars. And so I came over to LROC and started making them on the moon. And at that time, we were starting our remapping project for Apollo 15, which is the first Apollo mission with a rover. And I had GIS yeah. experience. So I was brought on to uh, be involved with that portion of the mapping. So just real quick, what got yeah. you interested in GIS in the first place? Why do you? So and GIS, uh, Global Information Systems, right? So I guess we yeah. should got to watch exactly. our acronyms, but. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah, so I was interested in it really as a way of understanding 
like planetary surfaces. So I was interested in, um, I started out in Mars. And so I was mapping these features on Mars called ballet networks. And so to do that, you need to take your image and you need to map onto it. And so GIS is what allows you to map onto it. So. Um, Excellent. Okay. Yeah. And then you've got some amazing things to show us about Apollo 17, yeah. right? Yeah, I've got a slide, um, a slideshow prepared. So some of us are old enough to remember, right, <laughs> Apollo 17 live. So yeah. 50 years ago was the last in, in this month, right? So yeah. it was it December 12th? Is that what it was? So we, we um, uh, 50 years yes. ago. Um, so it was actually uh, sort of our last visit. Go ahead. I'm going to I'm going to oh, let you know. I'm Sorry, yeah, so it's a week ago today, so the 7th was the 50th anniversary of the launch, and then the 11th was the uh, landing anniversary. So, um, yeah, so it's kind of currently, and you'll see it, it went until the 19th, so we're kind of currently in that span of time for um, when the mission took place. So, yeah, so uh, here we go, Apollo 17, the last mission. So. Um, first off, I wanted to start by talking about the resources that we've been developing. So um, here at El Rock, part of our mission um, was we wanted to go back and re-examine the Apollo sites um, and remap them, kind of develop a spatio-temporal understanding, so both space and time. Um, and Nicole Gonzalez, uh, when she was an undergraduate, was really, uh, really originated that project, has, has been super involved in that. Nicole's now a graduate student. And there's a whole team working on it now. So um, the first link up here is our spatiotemporal traverse, um, which is the map. Uh, we also wrote up a featured image post on our website, um, just talking about the mission, its significance, what they did. Um, and then we also have a video that's got um, audio and visuals from the mission incorporated to talk about it more. So um, that's those are the three resources that we've developed. Um, let's get into the mission. So. Uh, yeah, like I mentioned, December 7th to the 19th, 1972, so we're squarely in that time period for uh, the 50th anniversary. Um, the uh, command module was orbiting the moon for 148 hours, and then the astronauts were on the moon for 75 hours. And in total, there were three EVAs of 22 hours, four, four minutes, and in total, they covered a distance of about 36 and a half kilometers. Um, they collected 110 uh, kilograms, or about 243 pounds, of lunar material, and then um, it was in Taurus Littrow Valley um, was the, the location. So um, why Taurus Littrow? So actually this landing site was identified back in Apollo 15. So like I mentioned, the uh, command module is orbiting around the moon, um, while the other two astronauts go down to the surface and leave the third astronaut up orbiting the moon. And when um, that astronaut was there for Apollo 15, he noticed, hey, there's this, this area that's really interesting. I don't know what's going on there, but I think it's really cool. It's this super dark material. Um, so when they got back and they saw the, the photos, that's the landing site that they chose for Apollo 17. So um, this is an image from Apollo 15 from orbit. Um, all of this area, so this is specifically the, the area that they were in, but all of this material, this super dark material, is what they were interested in finding out. And specifically, they were wondering if this could be young volcanism, which they were really interested in understanding and seeing if they could take samples of, find out more about. So this is a really interesting area to target. Um, and what I'll actually do now is I'll switch over to Quick Map. So Quick Map, um, if you can, still see my screen, um, is a tool that we've developed to show our data here at LROC. So um, what I've actually been able to do is I've been able to bring in the um, rover traverses that we've mapped for the mission. So I'm just gonna walk you through exactly where they went um, on this mission. So right here at this point is the lunar module. It's the spacecraft that lands on the moon that they do all of their operations out of. So this is where they landed. Um, then for the first EVA, the extravehicular activity, when they're out on the surface, they went out. They went out here to the ALSEP, which is a bunch of scientific experiments. So they set that out first thing just to collect as much data as they could. Then they came back and they went south. So they came down all the way down to station one, right down here. 
Um, and so they had spent a lot of time with the LSEP. So it was just a short little trip down to station one. They came back, they set up another instrument called the SEP, and then they came back, they went to sleep. The second EVA was a lot longer. So this was the longest EVA of the mission and also the longest EVA uh, by distance on uh, of any of the Apollo missions. So um, again, they start out from the, the LEM, the lunar module, and then they go out and they go as far as they can to the furthest point for their next station. So they go all the way up here to the South Massif, um, kind of the edge of the valley. They do, they, they take samples, all of the things that they're doing, take fit photos, all the things that they do at the stations. They come up, sorry. They go to station three. They come to station four, which is at Shorty Crater. So that's an important one um, that I'll talk about in a minute, but this is Shorty Crater, station four. They do one last station at station five before they come back, go to sleep for the evening. And then their final station, sorry, final EVA, they go north. So they start out, they go up here, up to station six, which I'll talk about right up here, which I'll talk about as well a little bit later, but I'll kind of give you a preview. You can see, if you're looking, you can see some tracks down the side of this slope. This is a slope. Um, and what these actually are, are boulder tracks. So you can see boulders right here. Um, and they'd actually noticed these boulders in their imagery from Apollo 15. And so they uh, were targeting that for station six. Station seven, all the way out to station eight over there. Station nine, and then they go back to the, to the LEM. And so they kind of do all their wrap up stuff. They drive the rover out to this spot called the VIP site so that uh, so that it can be away from the LEM and then they leave the surface. So that's kind of everywhere that they went on this mission. Uh, and this is all mapping from our team um, about where the rover and the stations were. So let me go back to my slideshow and talk a little bit more about the geology. So this was actually a super important mission um, for geologists because they had a geologist on the mission, you know, for all the other missions, it was all uh, military test pilots. And, you know, you want that when you're doing super risky things on the moon, but they knew one, this was an established, these were established missions. They knew that things had gone smoothly for the most part um, in the other missions. And um, they also knew that this was gonna be the last mission. So as kind of a consolation to the scientists um, who had been working on these missions, they said, yeah, you know what, put your, we'll put a geologist on the mission and um, he can be there and bring back samples. So um, this specific image is actually a still frame from um, the TV camera that was mounted on the rover. So this is at the very end of the mission. Um, and it's not a super exciting image, except for one thing. So you see, this is Gene Cernan, who's the command um, module pilot, he's the um, commander. Uh, this is the, the, the LEM, the lunar module. And then right here, there's this tiny little white dot. So this is a, a pallet, but you see this tiny little white dot. That's actually Jack Schmidt, who's the geologist on the mission. And so Jack Schmidt, he's super excited to be on the lunar surface. He's taking all these samples. And he's also taking extra little secret samples. So, you know, if he has a long walk back, he'll stop kind of without telling him about mission control and he'll take a sample, take a couple of photographs and keep moving and kind of quietly increase the number of samples he's taking. And so what, what's cool about what's happening right here is um, at the very end of the mission, um, like, like this frame is from, he noticed that there was an extra core tube. So these core tubes were, just tubes that the um, astronauts had uh, and that you kind of stick them into the dirt, you'd hammer them down really hard, kind of all the way so that the soil got stuck up in the tube and then you'd take it back out. Well, Jack Schmidt noticed, hey, there's an extra one of these around. And so he decides that he has time to kind of go over to the north side of the LEM 
and just like stick it in the ground and pull it back up. So he's like doing all of this, doesn't even realize he's on camera. They don't even realize what he's doing really until he talks about it a couple minutes later, like, oh, I took an extra sample. So um, he was super keen on sampling. And of course, as a geologist, he wanted as much data as he could. But I really like this, this frame because it's him just right as he's bending down to, to take that sample, um, kind of without anyone even realizing it. So I think that's super cool. But um, that's just kind of a taste of what he was getting up to as the geologist on the mission. So um, yeah. And so I'm just going to talk about a couple stops that are really cool um, that they managed to find and come across in their mission. So um, the first one is orange soil on the moon. And so, you know, the, the lunar surface isn't totally gray and black and white. It's, there is some color variation. Um, you know, you get some, some uh, Mari that are more brown tinged or maybe cooler tinged. And so there is some variation, but um, what the astronauts didn't expect to see when they got to station four at that crater that I pointed out is that the, when they were walking, they were actually uncovering orange soil. So this, this is a trench that they dug and you can see it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's not bright orange, but it's distinct to, it's distinctly differently colored and much more orange colored than sort of the ter surrounding terrain, especially like right here, you know? Um, so that was super exciting, you know? Jack Schmidt gets all excited. <laughs> he's not taking great photos after that because he's so excited about this discovery of orange soil. Um, and so this was actually one, a really cool stop. And two, it actually helped them understand a lot about the questions that they were trying to answer with this mission. So um, when they took their samples and brought it back, what they actually discovered is that this was due to small glass spheres. Um, so this is actually small glass spheres. And what they're from are uh, these features called fire fountains. So kind of these sprays of lava. And you can imagine as you kind of spray a liquid, it, get, it becomes really tiny, tiny droplets. So you've got these tiny little beads. Um, and as they're cooling at different rates, they're kind of, incorpor they're kind of incorporating different um, compositions. So actually this orange material is these small glass spheres that are more rich in titanium and that's why they appear orange. And more than that, the tiny glass spheres that are more iron rich are actually really darkly colored. So, you know, this whole area that's dark that they're wondering, oh, is this young volcanism? Why is it so dark? it's actually because of fire fountains and it's not young at all. It's actually probably from three and a half billion years ago. So um, actually not only is Shorty Crater, the stop at Shorty Crater really cool, like just looking at visually, it's actually, it was really crucial to understanding and answering some questions from their mission. So um, yeah. And then the second kind of cool spot that I already pointed it out um, is these boulders at station six. So station six, sorry, my thing is covering it up for me. So station six was right here, if you'll remember. And in their Apollo 15 imagery, they had actually noticed what they thought was a single boulder rolling down. And it, it was a single boulder at one time, but actually when they show up, it's actually five boulders. So this is the second boulder um, fragment. And this is just kind of the image that I that I have, but I'll pop up a map in a minute, but it's actually five, five boulders, all kind of one, that used to be one boulder that broke apart. So um, this, this figure is from the preliminary science report. Um, and what we're looking at is this surface right here uh, in the image. So um, what they actually noticed as they were kind of walking around trying to get their bearings um, and sampling the boulder, is that there were some areas that seem brecciated, so, you know, angular class. Um, and then there were some areas that were evidence of a flow. So they weren't really sure what's going on here. It turns out that that's because these boulders, you know, you're also wondering how does the boulder get all the way up to the top to roll back down, right? So it's actually from the um, impact that formed the serenitatis, Mari serenitatis, so the the sea of tranquility, 
Um, so huge impact. Melting material brought the, these boulders up, deposited them at the top before they rolled back down and split apart. So um, I am including a picture of this because uh, this boulder is actually where they got uh, this sample, 76315. And you'll notice 76315 is right here, um, right on the contact between the more brecciated um, and the more volcanic material. So um, that's another kind of cool, notable stop that they made on their trip. Um, and uh, yeah, just more, more kind of history of the area uh, that they're uncovering. So yeah, so those were a couple of the, the cool, notable geologic stops that they made. Um, and just, you know, it's the final Apollo mission and it left a legacy. So it has not only just like, you know, the last one, but, you know, furthest EVA. So they went seven kilometers away from the LEM as the crow flies, but their actual route was a lot windier. And, you know, they made several stops to and from. So that was actually like 20 kilometers of traveling. Um, they have the fastest recorded rover speed on the moon at 18 kilometers. Um, Ron Evans is the astronaut who was left up in the command module to orbit the moon. He spent the longest time in orbit around the moon. <clears throat> Jack Schmidt was the only geologist and Gene Cernan was the last man on the moon and he was one of only three men who visited the moon twice. So, um, you know, Apollo 17 has a lasting legacy, not just because it was the end, but because it had a lot of cool events. Um, and I just really briefly wanted to kind of link it back to the beginning of Artemis. So a really cool coincidence was that the anniversary for landing on the moon, which I mentioned, um, was the December 11th, so last Sunday. And on Sunday, Artemis 1 actually landed back on Earth. So there's this really cool linking of, you know, we've got this mission that ended 50 years ago, and we're kind of looking forward to our future of our next generation of exploring the moon. So um, yeah, and Tori, that's kind of what I have to cover. You Tori, that's absolutely amazing. You just there's an amazing presentation. Thank you so oh, thank much. You. I, I have a I have a question for you. Maybe yeah. kind of going back to um, um, the uh, so the the massive. So basically, this is a valley. Yeah. There's the I don't know if you can go back that far. What do we, we call it up? But so the the little the boulder trails. That's yeah. what kind of fascinates me. These boulders roll down this hillside. And when you look at a flat map, when you look at sort of a projection just sort of like from the top, you don't necessarily see the slope, but this is quite a slope, right? I mean, this is a, uh, uh, and so uh, anyway, that, yeah. and then were the trails themselves, is that what they were able to see on the Apollo 15 mission? Uh, trails leading to the boulders and that those sort of sparked their interest and said and then somebody at some point said okay apollo 17 then is going to go here because of that yeah, i mean is that is that what happened you know that's a good question so um i looked through kind of the images that i could see um from apollo 15 and i couldn't like quite identify you were trying to find if they if there was like if there's a, a, a link there yeah yeah, I was trying to see if I could see tracks or see a boulder and I couldn't personally see it, but I also like didn't look exhaustively through all their orbital images. Um, so, um, but I imagine, again, I don't, I don't conclusively know. I imagine that the boulder would be easier to see than the tracks. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be surprised if part of it, sorry, I'm trying to pull up the 3D view. There we go. And, and I, I, I learned tonight also that um, uh, just a, essentially sort of about the, you know, the, the, the technology here and all that stuff. I think it's really, really amazing. So, yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, um, yeah, 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 yeah. It is, it is quite a steep slope that you can't really see in the. I know that's, that's the thing. So you can't, you, I mean, you can see really, I, now that, oh yeah, that's a better yeah, 3D view. I mean, this is really a steep, steep slope. Like, in fact, they couldn't travel up there with the rover, right? They had to get to the base of the slope. No. And then this material would have been brought down from up above. It's almost delivered to this little area where they could sort of like examine it and do that, right? 
Yeah, exactly. I was kind of even, I was looking at like, cause there's the second track so close and I was like, Why? right. I saw the other one too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's they, like, yeah. like when they have targeted that because they could see it better, but it's like, no, it's like so much higher and so much further, you know, it's, but yeah, the, the Rover I think could handle up to 25 degrees and that, but that was like a pretty high cap, like a, you know, like a pretty hard cap and pretty, you know, you got a lot of trouble when you started getting that high. So they didn't oh, yeah. go that high, but. Uh, and this would have, this would have been a long walk back to the, uh, the lunar module if they did something to the Rover, right? Exactly. Hey, yeah. They were pretty, it sounds like they were pretty risky. They were kind of risk takers compared to some of the other astronauts, but uh, really? Yeah, no, no one wanted to walk back that. <laughs> you know, the, the other thing you're doing here, and Nicole did this before, you mentioned your predecessor, Nicole, yeah. and the forensics that you're doing, and you're talking about where they went, and then they went back, and they'd slept, and then they did this, and then they did here, and then slept. This is like uncovered, I mean, this is like sleuthing, isn't it? I mean, sort of just comparing what you know from the documents and the history and what we can see from the footprints and the trails and all that stuff. I think that's really absolutely amazing, and that you were born whatever, 23 or 24 years after this even happened, and you're so fascinated with this particular work and what these people did. I think that's amazing. Yeah, it is. It really, it is detective work. It's, you know, it's uncovering, you know, context clues, what they're saying, what, you know, what things they have to do in order to, you know, oh, they have to go back to the rover to get this. It's a lot of like piecing together all this different information. It's, it's really, it's, it's great to do though. It's, I, yeah. I, I've never heard Jack Schmidt represented as somebody that was trying to not deceive right mission control, but he was actually doing some stuff on his own. And then, and uh, I think that's really, super, that's amazing too. So. Yeah. I, I mean, who can blame him? Of course, anytime you can pick up a rock, you got to pick up a rock, but um, it was, it was pretty funny to, you know, I'll like see oh he picked up another rock of course <laughs> you know um, and then yeah he wouldn't he wouldn't say it until a couple of minutes later so no one could like say anything and there were I don't know I don't know um if you remember the but there's this the seatbelt stop on Apollo 15 where they kind of do the same thing they like they stop the rover they say oh we have an issue with our seatbelt but really it was like they saw a cool rock and they knew command would like tell them not to stop they're like no you got to get oh, back no. So, so they kind of did the same thing, but I think Jack Schmidt took it to another level and it was pretty fun but to do that. You're adding personality to the original, you know, uh, team. I think that was well, super, very, very nice. Good, yeah, yeah, good thanks. job. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to um, just stop here for a moment just to check. I'm going to ask Armand if anybody has any questions. Is there anything out there that we should, uh, we should address at this stage or I'll kind of move on to the next piece? Uh, yeah, we got a couple of good questions from the chat. Uh, Sam is asking if you could explain fire fountains a little more. And does that mean that the orange you were talking about earlier is left over from ancient volcanic activity? Yeah, yeah. So my understanding of these fire fountains is that, yeah, they were they came from really deep in in the interior of the moon. And they were they had a bunch of trapped gases and they kind of that propelled them up to the surface and yeah they erupted at the surface kind of sprayed this material out into these super fine drops and then it landed um and i i should mention also that uh the reason i kept emphasizing shorty crater is because it's that impact that kind of excavated that orange soil and that's why they found it there more prominently than anywhere else so um yeah so yeah it is it is absolutely volcanism um but it occurred it wasn't recent volcanism like they thought it was actually three and a half billion years ago. Whoops. Yeah. And that goes back to um, just ancient geologic activity on the moon causing giant boulders to roll down as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So very yeah. definitely they found evidence of the volcanism that they were, ex they were hoping for, but it was much older than they were hoping for. Awesome. Thank you. And yeah, keep uh, typing away questions in the chat. And if we're, we're able to, we'll answer them live. That, excellent. So, Tori, while we have you here, and um, can you can we just? I mean, we, we're kind of just coming close to kind of running out of time, but I wanted to uh, have you explain uh, what's happening with Shadowcam, 
uh, you know, real quickly, kind of what it is. I, I, the audience, if they've been following, we've been talking about these missions, but the shadow cam and then what stage of the mission it's in and what we can expect in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, 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 yeah. So shadow cam is super exciting. It's um, the camera. It's a heritage in, uh, instrument, so it was modeled after our own NAX on LROC, so our narrow angle cameras. Um, so we put this on KPLO, which is the South Korean Space Agency's first lunar orbiter. So um, we are uh, really interested in seeing inside the poles, uh, inside areas in the poles. So um, if I, I'll really quickly try to show you. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh yeah, perfect. So this this slide is for shadow cam, but. I've also got this little 3D printed model, which is super cool. Um, so this oh. is the South Pole. Uh, I just want to demonstrate. So on Earth, you know, we're tilted 22 and a half degrees about. So, you know, when we turn at the poles, light can come in and kind of hits everywhere. But Here, do, uh, uh, yeah. do this for you. Just stop share for a second. Oh, yeah. We'll I'm sorry. Yeah. That's what, no, that's all right. OK, so yeah. So this is my little 3D model. So you can imagine if it's tilted like on Earth, you're and I'll tilt it towards the the lamp actually. All the light is going to hit everywhere inside these little valleys, these little craters. You can see it, but eventually, eventually sunlight will hit all parts of that, right? Exactly. Yeah, but the moon is not like the Earth. It's straight up and down basically. It's tilted like a degree and a half, so very little. And so when it turns, you can imagine as light comes across the poles it's not hitting those really deep depressions. And so there are some areas on the moon that are permanently in shadow. Um, we call them permanently shadowed regions. Um, and so there are areas, one, that we can't see with our cameras because the light never enters them. And um, two, because they're always in shadow, they uh, are really, really cold. So they never get sunlight. So they can be 40, Kelvin or less, so extremely cold. Um, and because of that, they're candidates for finding ice on the moon. So here you can see, this is a um, quick map, and this is, <clears throat> sorry, the South Pole. And you can see these areas that are outlined in pink, the, those are the permanently shadow regions. So they're what we're really interested in. And so what we've done is we've taken our NAC design, our narrow angle camera design, we've modified it. <clears throat> so it's way more sensitive than LROC NAX, we've specialized it. And um, we've also added a feature called uh, time delay integration. So because of that, we can kind of stack exposures and we can see way, way better into these interiors of craters. So this kind of, I really like this little graphic, you know, you can see it's in shadow, but with our, our uh, with shadow cam, we're gonna be able to see it much brighter. And it's, we can see it because of secondary illumination. So light bounces off the edges of craters, Goes into there's the, going to be at least some some light bouncing around from somewhere hopefully exactly yeah yeah so there's light bouncing in and with shadow cam that's sufficient to see the inside and be able to take images of that so we launched back in August and you'd think well it doesn't take you four months to get to the moon right um, what we actually did three and, was, three and a yeah. half days, Tori. That's all it takes. Three and that's half all days. it takes. Exactly. Unless you're trying to conserve fuel. So oh. um, it yeah. turns out that actually um, this uh, this type of trajectory called a ballistic trajectory is the most fuel efficient option. So instead of, you know, a burn up to get to the moon and start orbiting, it's actually more. <laughs> more efficient fuel wise. It doesn't sound like it would be, but it's actually more fuel efficient fuel wise to shoot it up really far. It'll go into orbit, exit orbit, and it'll go out to a point called the Lagrange point. And so that's a point where the pull from the sun and the pull from the earth are kind of equal. And if you time it right, which we did, you'll, you'll stay on one side and it'll start coming back to earth. So that's what it did. We we launched it in August. It went out, 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 out to the Lagrange point, and then it started coming back. And it's coming back. And actually, on the 16th, um, Arizona time, 17th in Korea, I believe. That's, that's uh, day after tomorrow. Yeah, 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 yeah. On Friday. Around, okay. around. I want to say around 10 o'clock Arizona time. It's a, it's, it's one day, 15 hours from now. So if if my math checks out, that's that's around when it will be. So um, we're gonna do our first LOI burn and LOI is lunar orbit insertion. So 
it's basically we've come back and now we need to spend some fuel. We've basically been falling back. So we haven't been spending fuel, we've been falling back. Now we need to spend some fuel to get into orbit and to get caught by the moon. So that's what you can see here. And so you can also see, so we're coming, coming in, we're gonna do our LOI and then we're gonna start orbiting, orbiting. And you can see it's a pretty elliptical orbit at first. And then we're gonna do a few successive burns to get into a tighter, more, more circular orbit. Um, and so uh, after we do our first one on the 16th, we're gonna keep adjusting it over the next two weeks. And then our commission phase when we can start collecting data is on January 1st. So this that's- is like, This is like coming right up. This is something that we can look yeah. over, over the Christmas right holiday. Yeah. So are you going to have a Christmas or are you just gonna be doing this? <laughs> I'm not super involved in shadow cam. I'm okay, super excited okay. about it, but I'm not super involved. So okay, good. Um, I'm leaving that to all the other people to, to have to, to have to worry about, but yeah. Well, Tori, it's been, it's been great. Thank you very, very much. I'm just going to double check with Armand real quick, just to see if there's any other questions for you. And then I'm going to kind of move on to start closing out our program. We've only got about five minutes left. Thank you so much for being part of our program. I know, I know personally, this has been a big week. We've got a lot going on. And so thank, so to take an, an hour of your time to kind of come and chat with us, I really super appreciate it. Thanks for that. And I'll see you at the booth at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Right? Exactly. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. It's been great to to come on and talk about Apollo. It's It's been awesome. And Shadow Cam. So. Good, good. Armand, anything going on with our questions? Um, no, nothing for right now. We got one uh, question about does the moon have a um, magnetic field or not? And we will answer that. And I don't think we have time for that to answer live, but we'll answer it in the Q&A. Yes, that sounds great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Armand. Thank you, Tori. I'm going to yeah. see if I can do the like, I got a little uh, thing to launch here. I want to just kind of talk to everybody about a little project that I'm working on with two other colleagues at um, at um, at uh, the school, and uh, let me just sort of call it up. It's going to take just a second to get this sort of launched. Um, the um, we are. Uh, let's see. Hang on one one quick second. Just going to do this, and then I will share screen. And here it is. Um, I, I haven't talked to this audience about this before, but this is actually what you're seeing on the screen here is a, it's just a little flyer for a course that we're working on. And I just thought it would be interesting to some of the people that view our program. Uh, this is a, a, a regular college course, but there is also a non-credit version of this that is available. If somebody wants to take this, they can actually, if, if there's a little fee, it costs $50 to sort of do this and go through it. So two things are happening at once. College students are taking this, it's SES 1 uh, or 394. And what we're talking about essentially is just a little bit about how cultures uh, uh, kind of embed astronomical knowledge in their art is really what this is. And it's in conjunction with the Heard Museum in downtown Phoenix. They have just launched an exhibition called The Substance of Stars. And included in that are four cultures, uh, four Native American cultures. Uh, and, and what we're working, their artwork is dealing with uh, essentially their stories, their origin stories, their cosmologies, and uh, essentially how they have uh, in their culture sort of brought uh, uh, astronomical knowledge forward. And so you might recognize some of these, uh, <clears throat> the, and we're kind of putting some ideas to this. So the upper image in the top is Acomo, that's sort of the, um, the Native American community in Arizona, just south of Phoenix. And we're kind of, you know, categorizing or kind of collecting their information and kind of talking about journey stories that relate to cosmology and uh, uh, the um, uh, Haudenosaunee, which is Seneca in uh, New York and their origin stories in Yupik, which is Alaskan culture. We're talking about sort of the transcendence of uh, astronomical thought and knowledge that, uh, that they're sharing. And in Diné, which is, uh, we 
sort of think of Navajo and Diné as the same thing. That's their their a term for it is Diné, and and their sense of place, their they sort of landscape that they put around sort of being within uh, sort of an astronomical construct. And so this has been a long time coming. I'm very, very sort of proud of of the work we've been able to do. And uh, anyway, this is something you might take interest in. And so I will make sure that Kim uh, embeds a flyer that you can get to this if you want to. It starts in January. And uh, uh, I've been kind of excited about the development process of working with the curator and the director of the Heard Museum as they put together their, their program. And whether you take this course or not, uh, I really feel like you should uh, sort of uh, uh, just go to the Heard Museum. If you're in, in Phoenix, some of, you, some of our viewers are not in Phoenix, but in downtown Phoenix, it's amazing. They have done a little bit of a renovation and they've put together this particular project and they want this to be permanent. They want in the Heard Museum to see some, some kind of permanent uh, 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 display and exhibition about sort of cosmologies that come from Native American communities. And I think that's really special. So I uh, wanted to announce that. Uh, finally, um, <clears throat> I have to tell you something that I'm kind of, I'm just going to get everybody to join the screen here as we go forward. But um, we've been kind of evaluating what we're doing with uh, the virtual night sky. And we're taking a break right now, right? So this is the last one of the year. And uh, I have to tell you that we we have to decide as a group that we are actually kind of change our focus. We're going to go back to being very specifically like online. Uh, we're going to, I mean, sort of, I mean, sort of in person. Uh, we're, uh, the COVID, I think, is waning enough that we feel comfortable getting people back in the, in the theater. We've had uh, a record number of fall visitors from school groups and things like that in the in the program. Uh, so beginning, we hope our target is beginning the Wednesday after Martin Luther King Day, we're going to be back in the Marston Theater, we're going to be back open, we're going to have our guests come there. Unfortunately for us, right, we're going to, this project that has been going on for, uh, for two and a half years, we're going to sort of basically stop doing virtual night sky. You guys are here and you're watching the last virtual night sky we're going to do in this particular format. It's been a great program. If you joined us late, we started this because of COVID, because we couldn't be in person, and now it's time to put our attention and our energies and all of our stuff back into to be back in closet. And I've invited this particular team. Uh, Alex, you have been with us since the very, very beginning. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I, but Kim Baptista, you sort of had to learn Zoom, I think, on the spot. I, re <laughs> I remember, as, we, <laughs> I remember we, we hired Kim, and we never asked a question about whether you know how to do Zoom or not, and then uh, sort of suddenly we all have to learn how to do this. And Meg, my dear friend, we've been together for 12, 15, how many years, 14, 15 years, at ASU and right along the way, oh, wait, your mic is off, your mic is off. And right along the way, uh, we sort of like uh, had to learn how to do this. And then it was wonderful to engage students. You saw Alicia uh, was with us. She's no longer with us now, but she had to move on to a, another position. But uh, but having students come along on the journey, I think has been great. And Armand, it's been such a pleasure to have you and your special insight and all this stuff. And uh, so uh, so it's been great. Do you guys have any any thoughts along the way? I, everybody's yes. who's going to talk. I, first. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to start with Armand because he's the newest oh. one there. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, no, uh, I just want to say, um, first of all, hi to my mom and dad. I know they're watching and, uh, special shout out to Bob, the Cardin family. They've been, uh, friends of the show and have been watching it since this, since the start as well. But, uh, I've really enjoyed being a part of the show. I think, um the science that people and researchers do is um just as important as the way it's communicated and like one of the favorite parts um uh i have about working in the theater or even doing these shows is seeing people getting inspired and so i love seeing kids typing questions in the q a the most random uh ridiculous one but <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my, been one of my favorite things to see. And I think it's, yeah, I think it's just uh, awesome that hopefully we've played a part in inspiring the next gener generation of 
discoveries. That's great. Well, thank you. I couldn't have said that. And that's and for the audience. That's the part of the show I never see. I can't be sort of the moderator and watch all the questions and comments come through. So I really depend on the team behind to sort of like keep that part going. So so thanks, Armand. That's in the inside I wouldn't know. So so tell me, Meg, how you feel about sort of like uh, the program. Oh, dear. Well, not all change is bad, everyone. And I just want to point out that it was yet another great idea out of that head of yours, Rick Elling. So many great ideas in that head. And we all agreed that uh, when things close down, one thing we could certainly could all do is look up together. And I think that this effort has been uh, wonderful and totally supported by our leadership. Uh, our community outreach group, I want to tip my hat to our supervisor, Professor Patrick Young, and to uh, our other colleagues in the community outreach group that we have, uh, we take it seriously. We certainly are glad to have the pitter patter of our K-12 visits. And uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, comments in the chat from our friends that are around the country. And what a great way to gather and uh, Armand and uh, also you, Alex, good to see the parents that are uh, viewing, good to have them on site. But I am very, very fortunate in my to have a job that you love to do doesn't feel like a job at all, but I work with some very incredible people. And the effort of this Marston Virtual Night Sky, it will live on on the YouTube channel. I know there's nothing like the real thing, everyone. But And for those of you that are going to be missing us, I double dog dare you to come and visit us in Arizona. It could be in February. That's pretty easy. Come in July, you'll see something too. But I really want to thank uh, Kim for making it so smooth. Zoom, what's that? <laughs> Totally figured it out. And I want to thank our, uh, our, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, sorry, but for those of us, some of you have been with us for the very, from the very beginning, and we appreciate your advocacy and your company. Thanks for letting us be part of your Wednesday evenings. It doesn't all go away. So come and visit us on site. I'm, what's behind me is the Marston Theater, and uh, we can't wait to see you in three dimensions at ASU, and uh, there will be some events coming up where we do this. So I want you to check in with us every once in a while, right? We're gonna, we're gonna see you one way or the other. Thanks for a great experience, everybody. Appreciate our audience and uh, friends near and far. Keep looking up. Good. Hey, I'm gonna, let me go to Alex and let you sort of comment. I mean, Alex, you were a student that joined us like from the very, very, very first. I think you only missed one program. Oh, oh, Alex is frozen. Oh, no. I think I he's know. frozen. Uh-oh. Yeah, it's because yeah, we're so go cold Kim in first. Chicago. Facial <laughs> yeah. so freezing. Kim, tell me uh, any thoughts you should share? Or... Yeah, this is a little bittersweet. I mean, you know, you and I kind of came up with this idea, and I had no idea what we were going to do or how it was going to go, and we launched it on a Saturday night on Memorial Day weekend <laughs> almost three years ago. So here we are. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's been a great experience to connect with people and share what we're doing and, um, you know, just letting everybody in on, you know, looking up and experiencing it. But um, there is something I've learned this week about being an AGU. There is something great about being in the same room with everybody too. And um, that's exactly right. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah we, we, never we, say we, never. I think we will do some special editions. I think but that's what we should do. But yeah. um, but I do think that we should be in person and, and doing this and sharing for those folks in Arizona and the ones that come and visit us. I do encourage you to come visit us. Maybe not in July, but definitely in December or January. Um, but yeah, no, this has been a very... Uh, I don't know, this has been a great collaboration with everybody. And it's always great to have like people from LROC and Tori and uh, all the different um, professors that we've had on the research. And um, yeah, so I'm I'm gonna miss it. I, this is not something that I really wanted to step away from, but um, I think it's time. And I think we will we'll do some special editions. And I think that that's, that's probably the best. And um, I'm gonna hand it off to Alex who is, I'm my partner in crime and I'm going to miss him in five short months here. He's going to like don't leave us. Maybe. I don't know. He should, he should go off and go, go explore, but, um, and do graduate. Well, work right. else, but, we were uh, gonna, Alex, we were going to give you sort of one of the second to last words and then you went dry. So we're going to we'll turn it over to you now. I have been strangling my internet connection for the past minute, but it's back. So I'll make this quick. Um, yeah, two and a half years. It's been 
crazy. Uh, getting to read all of your comments and getting to meet a lot of you in person. You, I have people come up to me and say, you're Alex from the program. And that's very astounding. Um, I hope that we've helped you learn a lot about everything that's going on around us, but equally you've helped us learn. Uh, you definitely at least helped me understand different ways of thinking about things through your questions and comments. Um, but like Meg said, even though we're not going to be doing these live every the other week, there is a full repository of almost every single show we've done for almost two years on our YouTube channel. There's like over 54 hours of videos of Rick and friends. And even if the exploration <laughs> stops on the live programs, it never stops because we still have all those videos. We have meteorite vault tours. We have talks with all the different teams from, you know, mass cams to uh, L rock to Luna map to James Webb and everything in between. So I highly recommend if you ever are sitting Wednesday night and you feel that something's missing, maybe just pull up a video, peruse the catalog. But uh, yeah, it's been wonderful being a part of this. It's really expanded the reach of what we've been able to do and talk to everyone. And I, I really have to be grateful for that. But check out the YouTube channel. I, I, I dare you. It's so easy. Even if you can't fly out to Arizona, you just type in YouTube, School of Earth and Space Exploration. You hit the playlist and you look for Marston Virtual Night Sky. They're all there. They're uploaded. I know. I've checked. I've been doing it. Go watch them. They're great videos. Pop some corn, awesome. everybody. Pop some yeah. corn. You can do this. And then, of course, come visit us when you're able to. We'd love to see you again. So. All right, everybody. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it to a close. But I do want to thank Tori again for your amazing presentation tonight. And Tori, you are representing, uh, you know, just you know, whatever the dozens and dozens and dozens of guests we bring on to sort of like just kind of talk about what they're passionate about. And if 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 it's uh, if anything has come through, there's a bunch of people that are really passionate about their work, and we really love what we do. And so uh, so there's a way to keep experiencing the school of earth and space exploration once you kind of think live think coming to visit us but also uh, we will as kim said we're going to find ways to sort of like get out in other ways and uh, and keep uh, keep in communication so so thank you very much for being a loyal audience and following us for a while and that's where we're going to wrap up thank you very much and uh, have a great holiday keep looking at the stars keep watching things go on and uh, and we'll see you next time thanks bye bye Thank you, everyone.